Hello, everyone. Uh, my talk is titled A Plural Approach to Survivor-Centered Justice, the Case of Tort Law. Uh, and it's based on my PhD thesis, which I recently defended at the Department of Sociology of Law at Lund University, where I focus on the meaning of justice for victim survivors of sexual violence and the implications for different justice systems, mechanisms, and practices. It's safe to say that the dominant justice paradigm for thinking about justice in case of sexual violence is that of criminal justice. However, despite legislative reforms, enhanced social and legal services, and specialized training of professionals within the criminal justice system, attrition rates remain high and conviction rates low. If we believe that high levels of education, strong belief in adherence to the rule of law, relatively strong health and welfare services, coupled with high levels of gender equality, are the ingredients it takes to ensure higher conviction rates in case of sexual violence, the Nordic countries seem to largely disprove that hypothesis. Increasingly, feminist scholars have argued for a broader understanding of justice, as opposed to only focusing on criminal justice. This research agenda uh, entails gaining a better understanding of the meaning of justice for survivors of sexual violence and exploring the justice potential of different formal and informal procedures and practices within different paradigms of justice. These include civil justice, administrative justice, restorative justice, and transformative justice. In this context, I will discuss the justice potential of standalone civil tort lawsuits from the perspective of 35 victim survivors in Iceland and how such an approach can be further developed to better meet their justice interests. So what is survivor-centered justice? Studies indicate that there are several elements that inform the meaning of justice for survivors of sexual violence. These include having a voice and being able to speak about what happened to them in their own words and in a meaningful context, being treated with dignity and respect in the justice procedure, and this entails giving and receiving information and being able to participate in the procedure, experiencing validation and vindication and having their experience fully recognized. Also, due to shame, stigma, and trauma, survivors uh, often experience social isolation in the aftermath of sexual violence, and therefore, regaining a sense of belonging, connectedness, and support is of vital importance. Meaningful consequences for the offender include offender accountability and responsibility, but it is not necessarily connected to punishment. Finally, the prevention of sexual violence is of fundamental importance to survivors' sense of justice. It entails the transformation of society into one that understands and recognizes the harms of sexual violence and that actively makes efforts to reduce its prevalence and therefore goes beyond, although still includes, the rehabilitation of individual offenders. So now let's turn to uh, tort law and its advantages, uh, which have been identified from the perspective of victim survivors of sexual violence. So the advantages of tort law uh, include that there is a lower standard of proof than in criminal law, and therefore a higher likelihood of legal recognition. The plaintiff is a full legal subject, and therefore has more control over the action, and this can have an empowering effect. And a growing number of successful claims can motivate others to take legal action and have a public impact. Uh, some of the main disadvantages of tort law, however, is the financial risk for plaintiffs to pursue legal cases, and also the risk of impecunious defendants, uh, where defendants have been found perhaps liable uh, for the harm uh, of rape, but uh, do not have any money to pay the compensation. And we also have to be remindful of what Nikki Cotton uh, talks about, who is, Nikki Cotton is a, is a UK-based um, feminist legal scholar, and she has said that framing rape as a civil as opposed to a criminal wrong and placing the responsibility of pursuing a case on the survivor could trivialize and privatize the wrong and harm of rape. <clears throat> so
So now I'm going to uh, briefly go over some of the main uh, justice goals of tort law. So the goal of deterrence is often explained within the framework of economics. The idea here is that uh, the economic rational person is deterred from causing injury to others due to costs. Then we have corrective justice, which is the main justice theory in case of personal injury cases. And here the idea is that compensation can restore the injured person, or at least the goal of compensation, is to restore the injured person to the same state as they formerly enjoyed before the harmful event. Scholars have also argued that tort law not only incorporates corrective justice, but also distributive norms. And distributive justice refers to the socially just allocation of resources. So the allocation of rights and the act of adjudication are, for example, always a matter of distributive justice. And while plaintiffs and defendants bear most of the legal costs of the tort case, the courts uh, do not recoup its full running costs from its users and are therefore partly dependent upon public funding. Assigning monetary value to personal injury can make us deeply uncomfortable. What is the value of a life? What is the value of a lost limb? And what is the value of the harms of sexual violence? This dilemma is well known given that harm and economic loss are ontologically of a different kind. The legal scholar Margaret Radin has therefore suggested that if we do not want to do away with non-pecuniary compensation, we must give it a symbolic meaning. She suggests reconceptualizing corrective justice in the following way. So here compensation is a form of redress which affirms public respect for the existence of rights and public recognition of the transgressor's fault with regard to disrespecting rights. I would, have, however, suggest that Radin's emphasis on public respect and public recognition indicates that her formulation of corrective justice is perhaps rather informed by the norms of distributive justice. So before discussing the findings of the study, I would like to briefly outline the concept of taboo trade-offs. So scholars in different disciplines have shown how trade-offs between monetary and non-monetary goods can be considered problematic and even a taboo. Here the idea is that the exchange of material goods for values such as honor, love, and justice is considered to be taboo and can have moral implications. So merely making explicit the possibility of certain trade-offs can undercut one's self-image and degrade one's moral standing. And to transgress this normative boundary is to disqualify oneself from certain social roles. So this is something to keep in mind while we discuss the findings. So now I want to introduce you to the participants in the study. And so I interviewed 35 uh, people who had been subjected to sexual violence, uh, 32 women and three men. The age range of participants was between 19 and 67 years of age. And age at the time uh, when they were subjected to the violence was from childhood up until 42 years of age. And the type of violence they described was uh, rape, attempted rape, child sexual abuse, sexual harassment, technology-related sexual violence, and prostitution. And the offenders were men and boys, uh, apart from one girl and one woman. And I also wanted to mention that uh, of the 35 participants, 17 had reported a total of 21 cases to the police with different results, uh, but four participants had received compensation following a guilty verdict, and four participants had been awarded compensation following a guilty verdict but were awaiting a final decision as the case had been appealed. And the interviews were analyzed uh, using thematic analysis. So now let's turn to the findings. Uh, participants often described extensive pecuniary and non-pecuniary losses due to the violence they were subjected to. Uh, and this included loss of salaries and wages, interruption or discontinuation of studies, psychological counseling, physiotherapy, and some had uh, gone on rehabilitation or disability benefits. They talked about experiencing anxiety, depression, flashbacks, nightmares, eating disorders, 
thoughts of suicide and suicide attempts. And they also talked about how, adverse, uh, how this had had an adverse impact on their sense of self and their relationship with their loved ones. As a woman in her early 30s said, this impacts the relationship with my family, my partner, and just my self-image, my relationship with myself. This has had extensive effects on my career. I've suffered major financial losses by not being in the labor market. And of course, I dropped out of school twice. The first theme identified in the interviews was the ambivalence participants described in relation to receiving compensation from the offender for the harms of sexual violence. Most, if not all, participants felt that money cannot compensate for sexual violence and felt that such monetary compensation was, in effect, dirty money. At the same time, however, many also felt that it was only fair to receive compensation. As a woman in her late 20s said, personally, I would never accept any money because it's just dirty money and it's disgusting. Okay, yes, perhaps some think it's good that they have to pay, but money doesn't matter. I have been in a car accident and received money, but it didn't do anything for me. Okay, yes, I could maybe pay my physiotherapist, but I'll never get my health back. Okay, perhaps you can use it to pay psychologists or work, work on yourself and try to get over it. So this is uh, a little bit in line with taboo trade-off theory, indicating that exchanging material goods for the harms of sexual violence is con considered to be highly problematic and even a taboo. Another theme in the interviews was that survivors felt that they were risking their credibility by pursuing compensation. As a woman in her mid-20s said, for me, it was never a question of money. I didn't even file a compensation claim with my criminal case. I felt like it would undermine what I was saying, as it would be understood as I was only doing this for some money, or you know, that it would be more likely that I wasn't telling the truth. And a woman in her early 30s said, I don't want their money, but I think it's really stupid that you can't even mention the financial loss. And I asked her, why can't you mention the financial loss? Because then you're just greedy, then you're materialistic, and probably lying. So again, fitting within the framework of taboo trade-off theory, merely making explicit the possibility of accepting monetary compensation in case of sexual violence risks undercutting one's self-image and degrading one's moral standing. To transgress this normative boundary risks disqualifying oneself from certain social roles. That's to say, one cannot have been subjected to sexual violence if one pursues or accepts monetary compensation. So the risk of moral judgment should also be understood in the wider context of social myths about how, quote unquote, real victims behave, which largely function to undermine survivors' credibility. So while participants generally did not equate compensation with justice, many understood a favorable verdict in a civil case as an acknowledgement, a confirmation that they had been subjected to something terrible uh, and that the offender was not simply innocent of any wrongdoing. When asked about their understanding of justice, many did not equate justice with punishment, but rather with a different kind of justice. And as a woman in her early 30s said, I can't speak for others, but I can't imagine that punishment or compensation has resulted in anyone experiencing a sense of justice. Perhaps, but perhaps a sincere apology and an understanding of the violation and the consequences could. And also to know that no one else will be violated. That is something that could give you the feeling that it was worth going through this. And as a woman in her uh, late 20s uh, also said, I wouldn't want the money. If it would be compensated in another way, you need to go to a course on this, you need to sit there and just, you know, learn about human interactions or gender relations or, to, or how to behave in certain circumstances or something to improve yourself to try to prevent this from happening again. So a meaningful justice outcome for most participants was therefore not associated with monetary compensation, but rather with a sincere apology from the offender, offender rehabilitation, and having the offender take responsibility for their actions and ultimately the prevention of further violence. 
In this context, prison was associated with violence prevention rather than punishment in cases where participants believed that the offender lacked all capacity to take responsibility for their actions and therefore needed to be imprisoned. So now to the policy implications of, of uh, these findings. Uh, there have been some policy discussions in Iceland about eliminating the financial risk for survivors of sexual violence to pursue tort cases. The Minister of Justice has currently under review proposals suggesting that survivors should be afforded the right to legal aid to pursue civil claims outside the criminal justice system and that the state should guarantee the amounts awarded in the same way as for compensation uh, awarded in criminal cases. The policy is to be understood as an acknowledgement of the society's responsibility for the wrong and harm of sexual violence. And also, uh, coupled with an understanding of tort law as partly embedded in the norms of distributive justice, such a state-funded tort law option can no longer be understood as privatizing the harm of sexual violence, but rather as a public-private hybrid option. However, um, the findings indicate that survivors do not equate monetary compensation with justice, but regard it as dirty money. Instead, survivor-centered justice is related to offender accountability and responsibility. If the above-mentioned proposals were enacted, the state would guarantee awarded damages, at least up to a certain amount, in such civil tort suits. This would mean that the wrongdoer is indebted to the state. In order to further meet survivor's justice interest, the state could then proceed to offer the wrongdoer a debt discount if the person successfully completes a specially designed offender accountability program. Such a policy could give this taboo trade-off an alternative meaning as it would be used as leverage to incentivize accountability. <clears throat> so given the serious uh, justice deficit in cases of sexual violence, particularly in cases of rape, it's of great importance to also look beyond criminal justice in our efforts to meet the justice interests of victim survivors and develop alternative ways to hold the state and offenders to account. While the tort law option as it stands only meets victim survivors' justice interests in a limited way, the findings of the study and the suggested policy proposals show how it might be possible to further employ the mechanisms of social justice to the tort law option and thereby better meet survivors' justice interests. It remains to be seen, however, whether these proposals will be enacted and further developed. So now I have um, uh, finished my talk, and um, I just wanted to say at the end that this talk is largely based on a newly published uh, article from my compilation thesis, and my thesis it is uh, titled Decentering uh, Criminal Law. And you can access uh, the thesis and accompanying articles on the Lund University Research Portal. So now I thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, please send me an email to the email below. Thank you very much.